I'm here in Tamalville, a small little border town on the border of Papua New Guinea and Indonesian occupied Papua. And I'm holding a bomb that was dropped just a few kilometers from here in Indonesia occupied Papua in a town called Kiwi Rock. Now this bomb was walked here by refugees who, that had to escape Kiwi Rock and flee because they were getting shelled from rockets and bombs like these. I'm here to figure out who dropped the bomb, who made the bomb and why it was used on civilians. And I'm kind of screwing up this intro because, um, because I'm holding a bomb and I'm terrified. That's my producer, Chris Joe. And no, I didn't send him to track down the bomb used on my house. He's on the island of New Guinea, not even 100 miles north of Australia. Yet, an island that's hosted a 60-year guerrilla war with opposing forces so disparate that whilst one side uses an array of armaments that have included illegal chemical weapons, rockets, sniper rifles, mortar bombs, the other side has been forced to defend themselves, sometimes only using bows and arrows. It's a war that few in the West have ever heard of, and it's likely that the few that do pay attention to it only do so because it's inconvenienced their profiteering in the region. Indonesia's occupation of West Papua. The island of New Guinea was one of the last places on earth interfered with by outsiders, with most of the people in direct armed conflict with the Indonesian government only becoming aware of their occupation, and through this occupation, the outside world within the last few decades. How this occupation came to be and why it's tolerated by virtually every government on earth is probably one of the worst stories of Cold War real politic expedience and betrayal of the 20th century. In 1828, the Dutch claimed the western half of the island of New Guinea and it eventually became part of the Dutch East Indies, whilst the eastern half of the island was tossed between various colonial powers. In the 1940s, after a bloody war, Indonesia gained independence from the Dutch, yet the Dutch were still claiming the western half of the island of New Guinea. This was kind of a point of contention as recently unshackled from their colonial masters, Indonesia had their own expansionist ambitions, yet the Dutch were feigning concern for the indigenous Papuans on the island as a way of continuing their claim over the territory, a territory whose riches foreign forces were becoming increasingly aware of. This all came to a head when Indonesia, growing increasingly frustrated with the failures of a decade of diplomatic efforts in seizing West Papua, in the early 1960s began military incursions onto the island preparing for a large-scale conflict to seize the territory from the Dutch. As this is happening, the Kennedy administration is growing increasingly concerned about Indonesian President Sukarno's ties with the Soviet Union and the prospect of a war between the Netherlands and Indonesia, which would serve to strengthen anti-Western forces within Indonesian politics. So the US forces the Dutch and Indonesians to the negotiation table where they carve out what came to be known as the New York Agreement in 1962, basically an agreement that gave Indonesia West Papua, with the US government itself describing it as an almost total victory for Indonesia. It's also worth mentioning that one of Kennedy's de facto advisors, the man who gave Kennedy advice on admin picks, was Robert Lovett, a board member and on and off director of Freeport. That's a mining company, the significance of which will become very apparent very soon. The New York Agreement stipulated that the UN would administer West Papua for a few years, then Indonesia, then an act of free choice to be held before 1969, which was meant to be a vote on Papuan independence. What this act of free choice actually came to be was Indonesia rounding up around a thousand West Papuans, handpicked by the military, and under the threat of violence asking them, do you want West Papua to be independent or part of Indonesia? Also answer out loud. Also, we'd prefer if you read from this script. And that's how Indonesia, the largest Muslim country in the world, took control of West Papua, a Melanesian, predominantly Christian, and before that, animist region. You honestly couldn't find two more different cultures. This occupation has not been without resistance. The OPM, Organisasi Papua Madurka, or Free Papua Movement, formed and has been fighting off Indonesian occupation since the beginning. It's not an even fight. As coming from traditional tribal societies, the OPM had to begin fighting one of the largest militaries in the world with poison arrows and spears. To even manage to survive this long is a testament to the skill of OPM fighters. In retaliation for suspected OPM movement, the Indonesian government will resort to widespread and indiscriminate attacks against entire villages. Just one particularly bloody example, in 1977 and 78, the Indonesian army conducted a massive bombing campaign over villages in the Baliam Valley, suspected of being sympathetic to the OPM with the Asia Human Rights Commission estimating that at least 4,000 died, but that number's probably a lot higher. The report also found that they died not just from bombings, but also killed in live burials, locked in barrels filled with water, and other means that are too brutal to describe here. 
This massacre was carried out with Western backing, with Indonesia using Australian and American aircraft, and this is a pattern that you will see over and over again. Western governments and corporations not only giving tacit approval for Indonesia to carry out its atrocities against Papuans, but handing them the very guns they use to indiscriminately kill civilians. And in what is probably not a coincidence, Western companies have had the privilege of plundering the great natural resources on the island for the entirety of Indonesia's occupation, including but not limited to the Grasberg mine the largest gold and copper mine in the world run by Freeport, the company I mentioned earlier. This mine is located four kilometers from Punjak Jaya, the tallest mountain in Oceania, one of the largest equatorial glaciers on earth. Just to give you an idea of how unique the natural environment is and how willing Western companies and the Indonesian government are to destroy it for a buck. Well, it's not just a buck. Up until recently, the mine was majority owned by American mining company Freeport, a company that continues to be one of Indonesia's largest taxpayers, accounting for a large plurality of Papua's GDP. But those riches really don't go to helping Papuans. As the provinces that make up West Papua, despite pumping out masses of mining revenue to the Indonesian treasury, consistently have the highest poverty rates in Indonesia. Well, to be fair on Indonesia, they are trying to address the issue, spending some of that mining money in Papua, mostly on bombs, rockets, sniper rifles and white phosphorus. If there's no Papuans, I guess there's no more Papuans in poverty. Whilst this has all been happening, the World Bank has funded massive transmigration programs, sending hundreds of thousands of Indonesians to work and live in West Papua, so much so that within half a century, the indigenous Papuans went from making up almost 100% of the population to around 50%. Indonesia will use any means necessary to quell any form of Papuan agency. Which brings me to this story. A story that is all too common in this war, yet a story that is never told as Indonesia benefits from thick jungle curtain and bans outside observers and journalists from venturing into West Papua. This is a story of a massacre. A massacre of civilians and the Western companies have profiteered from the bloodshed. Kiwi Rock is a small village situated in the Star Mountains, one of the most remote parts of Papua, right in the middle of the island, a dozen or so miles from the border with Papua New Guinea. Enclosed by dense rainforests and rugged mountains, the people from Kiwi Rock and the surrounding villages have limited contact with the outside world. And in fact, some villages hadn't had contact with Indonesia, the country supposedly laying claim to the land that they live on, until the 2000s. In September of 2021, Indonesian media begins reporting on violence at Kiwi Rock, alleging that the OPM, or as the Indonesian occupation prefers to call it, the KKB, translated to Armed Criminal Group, they're chiefly responsible. The media reports also claim that in the panic, two local health workers fell into a ravine, one being found dead and another being held by Lamex Command in the surrounding jungle for 12 days before being released. What happened next is extraordinary. The Indonesian army comes in. Through intermediaries, we hear reports of helicopters shooting rockets and drones, dropping bombs on civilians' houses and food gardens. There's also accounts of snipers and men with M16s shooting civilians. Pictures emerge of the attack, and it becomes clear that a large aerial bombardment took place. The worst of these bombardments occurred on the 10th of October, almost a full month after the original bout of violence. We obtain images of unexploded bombs and the aftermath of the attack. Yet due to the isolation, it's almost impossible to get a clear idea of what exactly happened. So I sent Christo there to suss it out. He sets off and meets with Sebi Sambom, the spokesperson of the OPM and their military arm, West Papua National Liberation Army. Sebi is a very interesting man, whose life itself gives insight into the unusual nature of the conflict. Sebi grew up in the remote mountainous Pass Valley. His dad was a cannibal, he didn't even see an Indonesian until he went on a school trip at age 12. He studied fisheries in the city of Yogyakarta. He taught himself English from reading a dictionary and has spent multiple years and stints in prison for peaceful activism. Finally, like many other West Papuans, he escaped the Indonesian side of the island and took refuge in Papua New Guinea. Oh yeah, and Indonesian generals have recently asked Interpol to arrest Sebi. Christo made a video specifically about his time with Sepi and how he as one man with limited access to electricity and internet runs the communications of a guerrilla army operating in probably one of the most remote places on earth. Oh, and it's probably important to note that as this was being filmed further west in the Induga Regency, the OPM had taken a New Zealand pilot hostage and in response, Indonesia was rolling out a massive military operation. So Sepi was in between showing Christo around and was negotiating that tense situation at the same time. Anyway, it's kind of hard to describe what happened there in third person, and I want to still be able to holiday in Bali, so I'll let Christo take it from here. I've spent some time living at Sebi's home, documenting how he runs his operation. 
He's the man in charge of communications for a guerrilla army taking on one of the most brutal militaries on Earth. Do they ever um, shoot Indonesians with uh, bows and arrows as well? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. yeah. And do they work? Then why are they afraid? Sebi has a rather large collection of photos showing casualties, weapons, ruins, and general atrocities. But he's most interested in showing me this. These videos are from an OPM meeting near Kiwi Rock last December. There seems to be consistent accounts filtering out about what happened there, yet little is known about the number of victims and what occurred in the aftermath of the attack. It seems Sebi and other senior OPM figures are some of the only visitors the village has had that have investigated an aerial bombardment of civilians. Sebi agrees to take me as close to Kiwi Rock as possible, which due to the remoteness involves a perilous bus trip. Well, maybe just for me. Chartering a single-engine missionary flight, we join Matthew, the Australian representative for PNG Trust, an advocacy organisation. The mountains we're flying over are some of the last frontiers for industrial society's advancing march. This is Telefoman, a remote highland village, the last place connected to the outside world we'll be in. We step off the plane for a short break and immediately we meet refugees from Kiwi Rock that have fled due to the violence from Indonesia. Through the wire, they begin describing the weapons they saw. Oh yeah, so, so it looked like a small <coughs> helicopter. Uh, let's call it uh, drones. Berapa, berapa bomb dari, dari drone? 152. Huh? 152 bomb they deploy, it's all in Kiwi Rock area, everywhere. You don't even have to leave the airport to get an eyewitness account of the attack. It's hard to believe that a year and a half has passed and Indonesia has faced almost no scrutiny. We take off to get closer to the site of the bombing. In fact, we're flying over Indonesia and chucking a Yui to land on what is a very steep and very wet patch of grass in between two mountains. A small village, barely inside Papua New Guinea, a place that has been the site of refuge for many West Papuans over the years. It feels like the entire village is here to meet us, but no, we're not that important. The missionary flight is the only way to get supplies in and out of this village, unless they're walked from days on end from Telefoman, which, like most of Highland New Guinea, is only reachable by plane or walking as well. That plane is this town's only way of contacting the outside world. This isolation serving as a cover for Indonesia's actions, or an excuse for the lack of concern from anywhere outside of these mountains. And then I get my introduction. I don't even have time to set up my camera. I walk to the first building I see and I'm immediately confronted with the evidence of Indonesia's attack. An old rice bag filled with shrapnel and an unexploded bomb. Oh, there it is. So that's the mortar dropped on Kiwi Rock. They shot by helicopter. As you can see, unlike our new friends sitting calmly in the room with a lump of TNT meters away from them, I'm too scared of the bomb to even film it properly. I then realise I probably should do my job and film the evidence that we travelled thousands of kilometres to see just a little bit. How big would the explosion be? Oh, I'm sure it would destroy everything in this room. Ah. Uh. We should probably put it very far away. Oh. <laughs> Where do you want to put it, Sim? This is metal, very heavy. Yeah, don't know. And big hole, uh, same, I sent a video to you, you remember that? Yeah. That yeah. big hole is this made. Yeah. The reason for the casual bomb handling is that this bomb and other unexploded mortars from the same attack have been walked dozens of miles through steep and wet mountains back and forth across the Papua New Guinea Indonesian border by the OPM and victims of the Kiwi Rock attack, looking to show anyone the evidence of what happened, so far without much luck. After some bomb weight estimating and bomb swinging, the bomb is placed further up the hill, at least 50 metres away from the village meeting that begins to take place. This man says that he's afraid that Indonesia is going to bomb the village we're in right now because of what happened just miles away in Kiwi Rock. Okay, thank you. Good question. So, um, uh, you meet people here, not kind of afraid because you got international law. 
by international law, Indonesia not in a bumping law, PNG side. Yeah, they will bump only Western side. Despite Sebi's reassuring answer, in the early 2000s, Indonesia landed helicopters in this village. So there is a huge degree of uncertainty here, along with the fact that only months before we arrived, there was a refugee camp here, housing over 100 people from Kiwi Rock who fled across the border after the attack, bearing stories and physical evidence of the bombing that no one outside of this village has been interested in receiving. But at this point, we're only starting to understand the degree of displacement the attack caused. They're part of the... Oh, this, this would be, this After would be the meeting, this. Matthew and I go through the bag of shrapnel. We start piecing together the remnants of numbers and letters, attempting to better identify the weaponry. Sure. It's a pretty idyllic place. Strange to think villages just like this one were bombed, as they had the misfortune of being located a few miles away, west of the 141st meridian. Uh oh, big. Is it in enclosure? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you got yeah, you suspend in. Oh Jesus <laughs> Christ! <laughs> oh, oh. Okay. Come, come back. Cast away. Dangerous path. We come around here. No. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, come back, come back, come back, come back, come back from the come back. Okay, we got that, we got that. No, 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 no. Come on, Sebi. Come on, Sebi. Come back. Oh, good one, good, good one. What do you feel like after that? <laughs> Have you? Are there cassowary in Pass Valley? Yeah. There are, so you've seen many. Everywhere in, the, in the, this island. So you know, you know your way around Cassowary. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> You're not afraid. Yeah, it's okay. Normal. <laughs> Normal. Despite the hospitality, there is an understandable angst that hangs over this village. Many of the people here have family living over the border, and there still are victims from Kiwi Rock coming and going. Before we interviewed the eyewitnesses to the attack, we had to assure them that we'd protect their identities. So we've given them pseudonyms and blurred their faces along with the translator. As they say, they are in fear of reprisals from Indonesia. Peter was there to witness his village, bombed into the ground. While they were cooking food, preparing uh, food. You were cooking food yeah. and did you, you heard helicopters come? Yes. No. No. Uh, yes. What did you do when you heard the helicopters come? Uh, they ran away into the bushes. And then they hide themselves. Alex was just 16 when his village was bombed. He was in class uh, when this incident happened. Where, uh, he ran away and joined uh, Pepe and Pepe. They use a bomb, a sniper, and a M16. They all describe rockets shot from four or five helicopters, mortars being dropped from drones, and soldiers with M16s and sniper rifles terrorizing villages on the ground, forcing them to flee into the mountains to hide. Many of the uh, uh, soldiers were using a, a sniper, sniper and a M16. Bombs were being dropped at the village, gardens are destroyed. Villages and gardens were destroyed? Yep. And what was dropping the bombs? What was, how were the bombs being dropped? Some bombs were fired and uh, dropped by uh, drone. Drone? Yep. Yeah. I asked the witnesses to draw the drones that dropped the mortars, 
the two witnesses that could independently came back with strikingly similar pictures. At first, I thought there was confusion and the witnesses were drawing helicopters, but they reassured me that these were small drones dropping mortars. This picture from 2021 shows an Indonesian soldier in Papua, seemingly from Brimob, the Mobile Brigade Corps, standing next to a drone model almost identical to what the witnesses drew. We've identified the drone pictured as a Xi'an Blowfish A3, a Chinese model that boasts of a swarm function, where 10 drones swarm a target in unison, utilizing artificial intelligence to take off and attack a target with full autonomy. This is the very cutting edge of modern warfare. You wouldn't have much luck defending yourself from these with bows and arrows. This man is removing parts of mortars dropped by a drone that got stuck in a roof. After you were bombed, did, did you, you went and collected these, where did you find, where did you find these ones? Uh, this one. Yes, bomb is uh, dropped uh, everywhere, uh, garden, village, and uh, etc. Was it dropped from a helicopter or from a drone? Camera, camera, by camera, no. Who are you? Camera, drone by drone. It's thrown from a drone. Drone. So this one, this one's from a drone, goes down yeah. like that, yeah. and it's like the it's the green, the yes. green one we saw yesterday, yes. and then this one, is this one come from a helicopter Helico or? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Drone by the behind. Come here, heli by the. Ah, this, this from helicopter. Helicopter, tower by one. Yes. Uh, were they shooting rockets at civilians? Ah. Tower by one. No. 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 Why? They were. They were. They were. How many? How many? Beer. They were. Masarat by one. Yes. Civilians. Civilians. We hear that those who couldn't run into the mountains to hide, mostly the young and the elderly, were the ones killed by the rockets and mortars. Bilha. Bilha was uh, killed by a bomb dropped. And who was Bilha? His sister's daughter. And how old was Bilha? Four years. Four years old. And, and where was Bilha when the bomb was dropped? Uh, uh, she, she cannot run away, so she's baby, and she cannot run away, so uh, while uh, managing to run away, uh, bomb dropped and killed. Killed her? Yeah. Uh, all people are unable to run away into the bushes to hide themselves. Uh, were bombed and killed. And killed? Yes. And they died from not being able to eat food? Uh, uh, no, they were bombed. No. They were bombed. They were bombed. Those who didn't die in the attack still had to survive being dispossessed without food or shelter in the Star Mountains, a place thought to be one of the rainiest on Earth. This footage shows the journey to relative safety the residents of Kiwi Rock had to make. They were in the bush, they stayed in the bush till now. Till now? Yes. And did anybody die in the bush? Uh, 200. 200 died? Yeah, from uh, starvation. From starvation and... Yeah. And did any family members die from starvation? Maria Rabai Bontan, Maria Dende, Adela Dende, or Nenana Dende, Dendi Raya, Nedon Mamina, Ginigia. His elder brother and uh, his brother and his mother died in the bush. Died in the bush. <laughs> This is a makeshift camp in the mountains. The people here are surviving on leaves. Continuous fight. Continuous. Now, now uh, uh, it's not safe for them to stay back in their village. 
to, are they scared of uh, yeah. Indo- are they scared of Indo- that Indonesia will bomb yes. bomb their guard bomb them again yes and that's why they're still in the mountains yes. it becomes apparent that everyone was forced to flee thousands of people hiding in the mountains till this very day no one has returned as the witnesses explain that since the attack Kiwi Rock has been guarded by Indonesian snipers with those attempting to return being shot at and in some cases killed. In October last year, Alex's uncle attempted to return to Kiwi Rock to retrieve his pigs and was spotted by a drone and then shot by a sniper from 100 meters away, with the Indonesian media triumphantly reporting this killing. <laughs> Civilian. Yeah. And he was hit by a sniper. Yeah. Earlier this year, videos circulated by Indonesian media show snipers shooting across the valley at the track to enter Kiwi Rock. This footage even shows OPM commander Lamek Taplo explaining that locals found a makeshift booby trap, a model of stun grenade seen used by the Indonesian police, tied to a tripwire set up on the walk back from the mountains to Kiwi Rock. Some of the victims made it over the border to the small village we're in right now, and I'm shown the site of the makeshift refugee camp where 103 Papuans made their home for over a year. Sebi was here last year and saw the camp when it was still populated, but these people haven't returned to Kiwi Rock. They've found another site somewhere in the mountains. Is this all stuff, stuff from refugees? Yeah. What is it? Fishing net? Yeah, mosquito net. Mosquito net. And then the bomb makes a reappearance. This time I'm able to get close enough to actually inspect it. Unexploded bomb. Yeah. You see it's got the screw on tail so it flies flies yeah. flat. And you got writing there. Still, I'm very scared at how casually the local bomb squad are handling the weapon. Oh, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> oh, no, 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 Matthew sent pictures of these mortars to an organisation that investigates the supply of weapons. These mortars were identified as being manufactured by state-owned Serbian company Krušik, appearing to be an 81mm M72, a bomb with a kill range of 14 metres. These mortars were identified as having an improvised tail boom attached, as well as an improvised impact fuse with a much larger surface than on a regular M72. Meaning these bombs were not fired from a mortar barrel, but dropped from an aircraft and were modified to explode when they hit a far softer target than usual. In this case, most likely the sago leaf roof of a villager from Kiwi Rock. This is consistent with the testimony from the witnesses. Yet our most interesting discovery comes from the bag of shrapnel. Most, uh, most interestingly and probably most identifiable is this, um, this little curled up piece of the, the cylinder of the rocket um, inside. It's got the letters 6, 8, which match up with a Talos model rocket. They're a big European company, which, you know, probably shouldn't be out here, you know, in the middle of the island of Papua being used on civilians. Stephen Loosely is the deputy chair of Talus Australia, the closest subsidiary of Talus to West Papua. But if we are aiming arming them, how do we prevent? How do we prevent these states that don't, don't have robust how, institutions? How are we arming them, and to whom are we referring? Um, I've got an example here. That's so. Do you know what? Do you know what this is? Looks like part of a spent round. Yes. Do you know what type of round 
this is. No, 7.62, something like that. No, this is a um, Thales made FZ68 that um, I retrieved in uh, around Kiwi Rock in uh, Indonesian occupied Papua. Uh, it was used on civilians there. I've got some pictures. Well, I'm not familiar with this, so it's difficult for me to comment. Yeah. So, <clears throat> this is a village in October 2021, a civilian village that the um, Indonesian army went in and uh, basically blew to the floor with uh, Tales made weapons, and this is part of it. How are we ensuring well, that? Well, that's, that's an assertion, but... I am unaware of any of this. So mm. it's something uh, that uh, you would need to be asking Indonesian authorities and uh, the relevant Australian authorities. This is not something that has come through my wheelhouse. But aren't you not an executive director? No, I'm the deputy, deputy chair, chair of TELUS Australia. Talos we do Australia. not export these kinds of uh, capabilities insofar yes. as I'm aware to Indonesia. But is it, is it not your responsibility to No, it's ensure? not. It's not. So this is, this is another piece of it. This, is, says, this is something uh, that should be directed to, uh, to TELUS Group in uh, Paris, if it's true. These pictures show the corpses of some of the victims of the Kiwi Rock attack. Papuans of all ages appear to have starved to death in the aftermath. A child, a middle-aged man, an older man. This woman appears to have been wounded in the attack most likely from the shrapnel of a Krushik or Talus explosive. A wound such as this is all but a death sentence when hiding in the mountains without access to medicine. This is the first time these images have been broadcast to the public. After almost two years since the attack, much of the evidence by now is likely to have faded, relegated to the memories of villagers who will eagerly tell anyone who comes here and speaks to them what happened. According to Jane's magazine, a military weekly, Talos licenses the design of the FZ-68 rocket to Indonesian Aerospace, an Indonesian weapons company, which then manufactures these rockets domestically. According to the same article, Indonesian Aerospace manufactures two types of warhead for the FZ-68, the FZ-32, smoke, for practice use, and the FZ-71, anti-personnel warhead. Professor Clinton Fernandez is a defence expert, a former Australian Army intelligence officer, he has studied the region extensively. What I'm holding here is a delivery device. It's not what kills. Um, this, these are the fragments, or they appear to be the fragments, of an FZ-68 rocket that's about one meter in length. Uh, it weighs about um, you know, five kilos. Uh, but on the head of the rocket is what's called a warhead, which is a 70 millimeter exploding shell, high explosives. That weighs about uh, 4.3 kilos. It's got a a length um, of 350 centimeters, very small. Um, and this rocket will fly for about six to seven kilometers from a helicopter. And then when the, it, it lands at the target, the warhead explodes. Um, this rocket itself will spin at 21 rotations per second. And the reason for that is its ballistic stability. When it's fired from a helicopter, you want it to, to fly in a, in a straight direction right on target. And so it spins. The spin stability is, is what delivers that. So that's what this rocket does. The warhead, on the other hand, is what you won't have uh, samples of because it's already exploded. So the warhead is a, an FZ-7071 rocket. These are the ones that attach to this particular uh, rocket. Um, and they are designed to explode into effective splinters of 8,000 splinters. So a rocket will splinter into 8,000 fragments um, around a radius of 21 meters. So basically 130 centimeter, uh, 130 meter circumference circle. Um, it's like steel rain coming at you. It's uh, anything in that circle is going to die. Its lethality is, uh, is why you have that rocket uh, and that warhead. I'm taken to the grave of a young woman who died shortly after making it to the village. Who was buried here? Anita. Anita. Anita Raibdana. Anita Raibdana. And how, how old was Anita? 36, 7 years old. Died of starvation. Oh, your, uh, sickness. Died of sickness. Sickness. 
Unfortunately, this woman's story is not unique. Each witness was able to recount many people they knew dying of starvation or other illnesses brought on by the attack. So we asked them to prepare a list of names. What they came back with was staggering. They handed me a list of the names of 297 people who they claim died as a result of yeah. this attack or incidents relating to the sustained military presence in Kiwi Rock. The witnesses claim that hundreds more died, but these are just the names of the people they can remember. Yeah, how did Southern die? They went to Oxyville town and then uh, make a protest of this military attack in Kiwi Rock. And then they shot him. I organised to go through the list with some of the witnesses in order to clarify uh, how some of the people uh, died. Jerry Tablo is arrested by uh, TNI and killed. And killed. And I got tortured as well. Yep, yep, yeah. tortured as well. He was shot in Kiviro. And was he shot by a sniper or? Oh, uh, in a bus. Uh, M16. M16, yeah. And he was, he was... Um, Fishful demonstration. The Marius. 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 Yep. Captured. Captured? Captured and tortured. In, uh, shot by... Shot. Gun. Shot by gun. He died of starvation. Died of starvation, obviously. M16. Masarat. 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 Uh, uh, she got two kids, so their uh, kids were crept and uh, killed, and uh, she was uh, shot by M16. The kids were killed? Uh, yep. Kids were killed the, also. Are the kids on this list? Uh, 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 they don't know the kids' names. Oh. So they don't know the kids' names, yep. but with two kids yep. who were also killed yep. in Kiwi Rock. Yep. Due to a lack of access, we're unable to properly verify the deaths on this list, but we did cross-reference them with a list of names of refugees from the OPM, and some of the names matched up. We spoke to Human Rights Monitor, an NGO conducting their own investigation through church groups into what happened at Kiwi Rock, and they came to the conclusion that around 60 people died. This report is yet to be released. According to the account from the local OPM that was accompanied by the photos of corpses and casualties shown earlier, as of 2023, at least 72 people had died. This report was also accompanied by these pictures of graves, and some of the names on the graves match the names of the witnesses we spoke to listed. Yet according to our sources, the mountain camps where people are hiding are scattered and isolated. As such, any accounts of deaths may be limited to a certain area. It is also worth noting that it's customary for the people of this area to use multiple different surnames depending on the circumstance, so we cannot make any concrete assertions to the number of deaths. What is clear though is that in an entire village, thousands of people have been displaced, shelterless, starving and unable to return home to this day. It is also clear that many of these people have died, mostly Nyalam Kupal people, a language group with less than 20,000 speakers. Well, this is definitely a Tales rock. As you can see, here are the um, here are the uh, villages. This caused uh, thousands of people in these villages to be displaced to go live in the mountains. Here's a picture of another Tales rock in a different part of West Papua. This, this is from 2021. And here are the people. Thousands of people went and had to hide in the mountains and have been displaced. Um, well, this is most unfortunate, and any kind of armed conflict is to be regretted. But it's not insofar particularly a, it's insofar not a conflict. As, Responsibility of Talos Australia is uh, concerned. I'm not aware of any connection with this whatsoever. This is a Thales made rocket. This is. Uh, well, you're asserting that, but can, I've can, not been able to test any well, of it. Well, if, if it does turn out to and be. And you should have forewarned me that this was the nature of the interview. The a report city. conducted by the Papuan People's Assembly cast doubt over the official Indonesian narrative of the events preceding and justifying the attack. It alleges that Sebi's group, the TPN led by Lamek Taplo, was not responsible for the arson attacks on the town. Instead, it was most likely a group supporting the former region, possibly supported by members of the regional legislature that carried out the arson. And why, why do you think uh, it would be used on civilians? I mean, that's very concerning, because this is the kind of thing that, uh, you know, to, if you use these sorts of weapons against your own people, 
uh, then arguably uh, one has to say, well, maybe you've lost uh, your legitimacy, uh, you know, uh, to to rule them if you have to use force like that. This is what we see uh, bad, you know, rogue states and bad regimes around the world using. Uh, but this one doesn't seem to get much attention. But if, if this is what's being used against uh, your domestic population, uh, then you know one has serious questions about how you acquired it, what what assurances were made uh, about where you would and wouldn't use it, um, and it's really a it's an anti-personnel weapon. It's not really designed as a policing tool. This now deleted Talis Belgium news page boasted the Indonesian army receiving a training course on the maintenance of FZ-219 rocket launchers installed on Airbus helicopters. These launchers are used to shoot the same Talis rockets found in Kiwi Rock. We put questions to Talis as to why this webpage was deleted. We received no response. Whether it's legal or not is a matter for the lawyers. Uh, it just seems to be gravely immoral. and. Uh, uh, I don't know the process by which uh, the Indonesian military acquired them or acquired the rights to manufacture them or the rights to use them. But it is something that really ought to be brought up um, at uh, uh, you know, the annual Universal Periodic Review of Human Rights um, that occurs at the United Nations uh, every year in Geneva. Even in light of serious human rights abuses, Talis Group continues to export to Indonesia and licenses many of its designs to Indonesian weapons companies to manufacture Talis products domestically. In recent years, Talos Australia has supplied Indonesia with Bushmasters, an infantry mobility vehicle, with former Defence Minister Peter Dutton gifting Indonesia 15 Bushmasters in 2021, with the Australian Army even training the Indonesian Army on how to operate these vehicles. In 2016, Indonesian weapons company Pindad struck a deal with Talos Australia to license the Bushmaster design and build their own model, modified for Indonesian requirements ordering 50 of these vehicles. Bushmaster is a, a, a marvellous weapon for protecting people. That's what it's designed to do, protecting people. That's why it's been so successful in Ukraine, for example. It's why a number of other countries around the world have bought Bushmaster. It's why the Australian government continues to purchase Bushmaster. It's a very safe carrier and it proved its worth not only with Australian forces, but with other friendly countries in Afghanistan, for example. So I am not going to have uh, denigrate the, uh, the Bushmaster. Please be clear on that. What is Indonesia using the Bushmasters for? So, some countries use them for police work. Some countries use them as part of their, uh, their military. Some countries uh, use them as part of their deployments elsewhere. It's a matter for the Indonesian government. Talis, however, observes the law. Papuans in cities like Jayapura and Wamana are all too aware of what Indonesian policing with heavy vehicles looks like, usually breaking up protests. Indonesia's capacity is undoubtedly going to improve with the addition of dozens of Bushmasters. And when the Indonesian army are probably, doing this, probably, probably conveying military, military personnel in very rough country. Probably. Mm. Shouldn't Australia have an uh, obligation not to sell Australia weapons when observes, other weapons are being used? Australia observes international law. And these are matter, matters for the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. That's where you should be directing your questions. OK, are we done? We put questions to the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and the Department of Defence and received no response. So that's 297 people. They remember 297 people that died. Yeah, yeah. they remember. That's, that's a lot. Do we have anything else? I would like your assurance that you'll make some representations. I've already, make... I've already said I will make inquiries. That's as far as I'm able to go. We spent weeks attempting to hold loosely to his word and get him to make the relevant inquiries. Yet the only further contact we received was this text. Suggest you direct your inquiry to the Talis Australia Director Communications. Over the course of months, we sent multiple emails and made dozens of phone calls to the Communications Director of Talis Australia, Jasmine Hilliard, and received no response. We also put questions to the Belgian and French officers of Talis and received no response. No. Uh, yes. Uh, 
uh, the, the manufacturer of this uh, bomb, uh, please, uh, I just says you put a stop to them. Stop making the bomb? Yes, stop making a bomb. Stop making the bomb. Yeah. The last remnants of humanity's pre-industrial past exist here in these mountains. This is the last of it on the planet. For some Papuans, these rockets and mortars would have been their first contact with the outside world. Chinese drones, Serbian mortars and Belgian rockets. Globalisation has truly reached the Star Mountains. A culture and people obliterated by showers of burning steel screaming from the sky, wiped out to balance the books of foreign arms companies and ease the way of industry that sees these people as nothing more than the cost of doing business. Thank you. Good Thank to you meet you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you.